We have a person from Congo. She's been serving in Africa for a number of years. Four years ago, right after we opened our new facility here, she was our keynote speaker at our missions conference. She's one of the most anointed uh, missionary ladies I know. And um, she has got a heart of gold, and she gets a lot of people saved, establishes Bible colleges, raises up pastors, and has done a wonderful work in Africa for her first 10 years. Now she's on to Congo to repeat the same thing. And I want you to uh, welcome this hillbilly preacher from southern Missouri that we all remember. If you were here, some of you will remember her, Rebecca Moore. Give her a great big welcome from New Hope Assembly. Where's the hillbilly? Where's the hillbilly? I'll find him later. <laughs> Good morning. No, I'm not from around here. Several people made that observation this morning. You got some sharp folks. <laughs> but like I said, I told first service, my aunt was from Des Moines, my great aunt. She married my grandma's brother and she always put on airs because she thought she was descending to come down to Douglas County in Southern Missouri. First time I drove through Des Moines, I looked around and said, I don't see what she's putting on all them airs for. All I see is cows and cornfield. I don't see that's a whole lot more sophisticated than we are. So, so I love y'all. <laughs> and first order of business is just, I really want to say thank you since the I was here about four and a half years ago, I believe it was March, it was missions convention, and you guys have supported me every month, and I mean, it came out of the blue, the call from Pastor Weaver at that point, and it was unexpected, and every time I see the Urbandale on the, the list of what comes in every month, it puts a smile on my face, and I have uh, a tremendous joy in the heart, because I really, really enjoyed my time with y'all last time, I've enjoyed this morning. And I believe the Lord has something to tell us. Amen? Amen? Did you come expecting to hear from the Lord? All right. If you have difficulty with the accent, I can switch to French or Spanish. And I promise I speak neither of them with a hillbilly accent. <laughs> I speak French with a Spanish accent, <laughs> which really gets funny. And when I was in, I'll give you the short run. Last time I was in Equatorial Guinea for 10 years, like the pastor said, this last term of four years, the first year of that four years, I went back to EG, closed things up, um, left my assistant, uh, a brother who had walked alongside of me in the Bible school and the teaching, and I got him all the way up through. He just finished his master's, and he's very capable of running the Bible schools in EG, and left him with that. Um, and I was invited by the church in Northeast Congo to come and basically do the same thing there. Uh, but that's a language change. So I went and spent five months in France, which was not lost time. The Lord always puts us where we need to be light. And there's no downtime. Even itineration time for missionaries shouldn't be. And I know for me it isn't, oh, it's money raising time. I'll tell you all in advance, my personal budget is raised. We're going to take an offering for the Bible school at the end. Bible schools, well, the whole project's going to be over a million dollars. First stage is about 300000 So if y'all want to help out, you're welcome to. But my heart, as I said, even the four months on a short itineration that I'm here, I want to see people saved. I want to see people filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to see young people commit their lives in the ministry. That's my focus. That's my passion. Um, and God's going to take care of the finances. Um, I spent five months in France, again, not lost time, learned a lot about French culture, learned all the different types of cheese. They pride themselves, you can have a different type of cheese every day of the year and never repeat the same type of cheese. And that's true, you can. But I found my favorites. Then I went to Congo, uh, landed right off within a week. I was teaching, God helped that first group tremendously to understand my French spoken with a Spanish accent and with a lot of Spanish words still mixed in with it. But I eventually got them straightened out more or less. And uh, <laughs> we get along all right. Um, because the anointing of the Lord takes over a lot and covers up a lot. And uh, whenever there's, I, I tell my students that I have two passions. I have a passion for the word of God and I have a passion for the presence of God. And in French, those both start with P. In Spanish, they both start with P. 
pour la parole de Dieu et la présence de Dieu. In English, it doesn't make a nice alliteration, but in French, it does. And, and so when that passion comes through, the Holy Spirit anoints his word. Um, I get into Northeast Congo. Um, I got in there in January. By that August, we, this was 2015. We started the Bible school in Kisangani. Kisangani, y'all can Google that after church, not now. I saw the phones out before. You do that afterwards. Just write down the name. Uh, and you can figure out where it's at. For those of you that went to school before 1960, it was called the Belgian Congo at that point, and the city where I live was called Stanleyville. So if you need to look on an old geography map, it's there. Today, it's the Democratic Republic of Congo, and I live in the town called Kisangani. It's the third largest city in Congo. Congo is about the size of a third of the U.S., like from the Mississippi East. And... <sighs> City is a relative term. Let's see. Kisangani is a village of a million and a half to two million people. And y'all know the main characteristic of a village. Anybody grow up in small town America? Because this is the same all over the world. Yeah. How do you identify small town America as different from big city? Silos is a giveaway, yes. That is a clue. <laughs> There's also the clue when everybody's related to everybody and everybody knows everybody's business. Imagine living in a town that's half the size of Chicago and everybody knowing everybody's business. There's a lot of gossiping going on. And in Kisangani, we have, <laughs> we have two forms of transportation, basically, because it's, most of the roads are dirt. They're starting to put a few dirt roads in, or a few paved roads in there. Most of the roads are dirt. So we have bicycle taxis, and we have motorcycle taxis. A few individuals have cars, but those cars just get in the way. And so all the motorcycles beep at them and honk at them and carry on and cuss at them and whatever, because they just block up traffic. Especially when you got potholes and everything, the motorcycles just zip around it. It's much simpler. Uh, and in, whenever you're on these motorcycles is a good place to learn all the town gossip. Now, let me explain motorcycle guys. We're not talking, uh, you know, 1500 gold wing here. We're talking a 125 hao jing. All right. That's a little cheap Chinese motorcycle that costs 600 bucks new. And that's after you shipped it and paid customs to get into Congo. So, you know, there's not much in there. And... <laughs> <laughs> and, and dressed like this. So you sit sideways and you hang on tight. And when out onto the luggage rack, that's assuming that there's nobody else on the luggage rack. And when you get home at night, you clean the red dirt out of the right ear because that was the one facing forward that got all the dirt flowing in. I realized when I got back to the U.S. this time, first time I cleaned up my ears and the Q-tip wasn't red in my right ear. I said, boy, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> but whenever you're on the motorcycles, you see life a lot more than you do in a closed up car. So I'm sitting on the motorcycle at, uh, <clears throat> we had a traffic jam, about 20 motorcycles at one uh, intersection there. For my Nigerian brothers, y'all don't understand this because y'all have way more people at your traffic jams. I'm in Kisangani. I'm not in the capital. I'm way up in the boondocks. And uh, so we're sitting there in the traffic. We do have traffic cops for the motorcycles. And so we're sitting there waiting, and the guy next to me on the other motorcycle starts making smart aleck comments about the white woman. And we're not very many. I, have, I haven't met any others that live there. I've heard rumors that there is one other somewhere, but I don't know. Never met her. Uh, so needless to say, I kind of, you know, stick out like a sore thumb, as we used to say. And this guy, guy's making smart comments. Well, his taxi driver looks and says, wait a minute, you need to talk with a little more respect. You don't know who that is. And I looked over. I didn't know that taxi driver from Adam. And he says, oh, she's a pastor. She's a missionary with the Assemblies of God. She runs a Bible school up and he gave the directions to the Bible school and all this. And my taxi guy driver goes, yeah, I heard her preach at such and such a church. I said, you know, you seriously can't do anything stupid in Kisangani because everybody knows you. And if you do something stupid, the whole community will know it before you get back home. 
So that's incentive to live right and live straight. <laughs> Ministry wise, what's happening? Well, you know, that's the fun part. And it, you know, the fun part of missions is always the living part. Um, but as you begin to live with people, I said, where I've, the places I've lived, both in Equatorial Guinea and in Congo, I don't live in American communities. I'm there by myself as far as America, the American mission is concerned. But I do have, I have several brothers that call me Dada, which is Swahili for big sister. And uh, I have a couple particularly that have just really taken me in under their wing and, and uh, I'm, I'm mama or big sister. And in African culture, quite frequently, big sister plays the role of mother, especially if there's multiple kids. Big sister is the one that actually is, does most of the cooking and cleaning and taking care of them. And so I'm Dada to several, not to, not to everybody, but to several. And God has given me those, those connections to pour in. And so, yes, I eat fufu. Yes, I eat Pondu and Chikwanga and all of those wonderful things. If you don't know what they are, you can probably look them up on the internet. They'll be there. Um, basically, most of that's out of the uh, manioc uh, plant, either the root or the leaves. But what are we finding in Congo? 75% of the population is under 25 years old. And most of our churches are over 50. Lifespan's 49 to 50 years old, so that means we have a problem. And we have a generation of young people who are hungry for something. They're realizing that the animism of the ancestors, well, that's not working. They're separated from the villages. And yet, the gospel that they see on TV and coming out of Kinshasa, the capital, and coming out of, unfortunately, some of our other churches is... It's a superficial gospel. It's treating God as a fetisher, as a, as a magician, as someone you go to to manipulate and get what you want. And as we're going in and in the Bible school, we're training up a new generation. And our Bible school is not just academic. We're going out and yes, it's academic. And yes, I set the bar high. Um, I, I is an educated hillbilly. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> if the education is only teaching something up here, it's not working. And so we take our students out and we're doing stuff. Their projects are very often on the field. Develop lessons to teach in your church. Go out and do an evangelistic activity. Do things. We go out as teams, especially in their course on evangelism. And God is showing up. And the excuses come, well, we can't do evangelism because we don't have money. <laughs> my response is all right y'all whenever jesus told the disciples take the gospel everywhere you will receive power after the holy ghost come upon you and you will be my witnesses what did he leave them he gave them the order to go to the whole world and to preach the gospel but what did he leave them he he didn't leave them a back bank account over in uh uh, Caesarea and say, yeah, over in Caesarea, I left a bank account with a few million dollars there. Y'all can use that. He didn't do that. But he promised them, I'm going to send you a power from on high. And today I want to talk to you about the only hope for our world. Congo, like a lot of the world, we're dealing with politi potential political instability. You can just do a, do a Google of the Democratic Republic of Congo over this last year. You can see some of the tensions that are there and we're just praying that God puts his hand over that country. It's been through a rough last 30 years. We're dealing with a generation that's hopeless. It's not that there's nothing to do, but there's a hopelessness and when the heart is hopeless, you're lost. What is the hope? Like I said, we're dealing with a lifespan, which according to the uh, United Nations is still 49 to 50 years old, mostly because of diseases. A lot of them sexually transmitted diseases because people aren't living according to God's standards. There's reasons for the standards God gave. And so you're dealing with a hopelessness and the UN has poured in billions and billions and billions of dollars. Other uh, NGOs have poured in billions of dollars. We've done all kinds of social activities and social events, and yet there is no solution. 
And the story can be repeated across the world in many countries. Here in this country, we like to fuss about all the things that are going on. Don't fuss too much until you've been overseas. But we like to fuss and fuss and fuss and fuss and debate and negotiate and this political party has this solution and this political party says no it's this and, and we're seeing all kinds of arguments of, and divisions over the difficulties that we're encountering and yet this morning I would pose to you that it's the same solution in Congo, in Equatorial Guinea, in China, in France and in Iowa. And the solution that we're going to look at is found in Acts chapter 3 and 4. There we find the story of a man who was lame. Now, this was a Jewish man. His family was evidently religious, at least outwardly so, because they bring him to the temple to beg. So they figured out that church people was the most generous people there was, which is true, and that's a good thing. Don't stop it. Okay? For those of you, and I just heard in first service, was, you sent a group down to Texas to help out with the hurricane relief. That is awesome. Keep doing it. The church should be the heart of Jesus made manifest. But listen to me, church. The heart of Jesus is not primarily for the social and physical well-being of the world. Jesus himself said the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. He didn't say the Son of Man came to make rich that which was poor. He said he came to seek and save that which was lost. And I have watched over and over and over on three continents now, whenever people give their life to Jesus and he becomes the Lord. You understand what I'm saying, Lord? The boss, the chef. Eh? When he becomes the Lord, everything else changes. When daddy's alcohol addiction is broken, guess what? There's now money to pay for shoes for the kids. Uh, whenever the things, whenever there's no longer another mistress to support somewhere, all of a sudden there's money freed up to help pay for a co kid's college tuition. And I'm talking stories that I've actually seen, things I've actually seen with my eyes. And whenever we deal with the root issues instead of just surface issues, it's like when somebody has malaria. Anybody ever had malaria here? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, malaria is bad news. Been there, done that several times. It, but it's easily treatable. But when a kid gets a fever from malaria, a lot of times parents will just start giving aspirin. Now, you give aspirin because the fever goes through the roof. You give an aspirin, what happens? Fever goes down for how long? About four hours till the aspirin wears off. Extra strength aspirin, maybe six hours. Yeah. And then the fever comes back. Why? You didn't take care of the cause. Does anybody know what the cause of all of the problems that we have in the world is? It's called sin. And so we can put band-aids, we can have patch-up programs. But if we don't deal with the root issue, that fever is just going to keep coming back and keep coming back and keep coming back. And so as we approach this story in the book of Acts chapter 3, I want you to read Acts 3 and 4 tonight. The whole two chapters. It's not a lot and it's a really good story. If you haven't read it in a while, read it again. Good stuff there. And we have the story of a man who comes. He was over 40 years old. And since he was little, they had been bringing him to the temple. And what was he doing at the temple? That's French. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Give me something to eat. Ah. I'm, oh, you want to see my foot? Oh, I can't walk. Oh. And here comes two young men. John was a teenager. So put yourself in this story, eh? This is not talking about your old deacons. This is talking about y'all. John was a teenager. Where's our 20-somethings here? Raise your hand. All right. Peter was probably in his mid-20s. So I want you to think of a group that's this age going into the temple like good Jewish boys for three o'clock prayer meeting. Three o'clock in the afternoon, not in the morning. They weren't that good. They were coming at three o'clock in the afternoon for daily prayer. And as they walk in, now 
they were somewhat known around town since the day of Pentecost. They had preached, and how many people got saved? And the Bible says at the end of Acts chapter 2 that they were in the houses together. They were discipling these new believers. They were taking care of them and, and teaching them the word and all the teachings of Jesus. But these two boys, they weren't real good pastors because they had a church of 3,000 people and they was dead broke. They didn't know how to take offerings yet, Brother Weaver. <laughs> And so they show up at the, the temple, and this feller's sitting here like always begging. And one day, he just happens to pay more careful attention to him and catches him by the eye. And Peter, now they had been here every day. This was their custom. Jesus had passed by this. But there was something going on that day. And Peter looks, and y'all know the story. They say, oh, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. And we have a philosophy, unfortunately, sometimes even in the church, oh, if somebody's hungry, they can't receive the gospel. Have you heard that before? So you have to meet their physical need before they'll listen to the gospel. In Missouri, we have a great descriptive word for that. Y'all know what hog she is? Again, if you don't Google it, you'll figure it out. That, <laughs> that means baloney. Y'all know what that is? Okay. It needs fried before it's any good. <sighs> Peter and John, they come and they said, we can't meet your surface needs. We're broke too. Matter of fact, after this meeting, we was planning on going scrounging something up ourselves, and we'll probably go over to Sister So-and-So's house. She cooks pretty good anyway, because we're dead broke. We can't afford to go to that new restaurant in town. It just opened up. But what we do have, we're going to give you. Listen to me, church. Number one, the solutions to the world's problems cannot be found in religious places. This man had been sitting at the temple for most of his life, and the Bible said he was over 40 years old. For decades, he had been sitting at the temple. He had been in church. There may be some of you today that you have been in church. You've been in the way 40 years. There's some of you, you may have grown up in church, but you've never had a saving encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to me carefully. Being in church will not bring solution. Jeremiah would tell the Israelites in chapter 7 of the book of Jeremiah, you go out, you have all this confidence in the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. But he gets down to verse 9 and 10 of Jeremiah chapter 7 and he says, but you go out and you rob and you cheat and you commit adultery and you worship other gods. You mess around with all these other things. And then you come into this temple and act all holy and say, we were delivered. We live under grace. We can do what we want. We were delivered to do all of these abominations. And God says, no, you can be in church. You can be in the religious places. But if you don't repent and if you don't straighten out, I'm going to wipe out you and the place. There is nothing special about the church except the person that you discover when you come here. But you can come to church and never know Jesus. I hope that you can't come to this church and be comfortable not knowing Jesus. <laughs> but there's nothing special. If you have somebody that says to you, oh, come with me to church. Your life's in a mess. What you need to do is get into church. No, what you need to do is discover who Jesus is and have a life-changing encounter with him. The religious places will not bring solution. Religious places will not save you. Number two, religious rituals will not save you. This was a place of sacrifice. This was a place where they did all of the ceremonies. And yet there was no solution for the problems in this guy's life. And take a look at Acts chapter 3. This is an amazing verse. Whenever he says, after he was healed, he goes in shouting and dancing and he's all excited. He comes running into, into the, the inner courts of the, um, of the temple. This is about the third court. He can finally go in with all the other men of Israel. 
and go into the um, court of Israel, it was called. Now I remembered the word. I forgot it for a service. <laughs> and <laughs> he could get into that inner court, and he's dancing and shouting, but look at the response of the people. Now, these, respons- these people had seen rituals, religious rituals their entire life. They had seen thousands of sacrifices, but in verse 10, all the people see it. They knew this was the guy that was sitting begging out front. This is Rebecca's translation. And they were all filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. They were shocked that somebody could actually come to church and find healing. My question is, why did that shock them? Because they were looking at the religious rituals. But even the people that were there knew those rituals couldn't actually heal a lame man. Religious rituals cannot save you. And this is one of our major battles in Africa and most of Central and West Africa. Is the syncretism and people that want to mix and pastors that want to mix. Animistic practices. Whenever I pray over people, number one, I'm very careful when I pray over people and I ask some pointed questions first. But whenever you pray over them and you say, go in faith, and they look at you and say, is that all you're gonna do? Where's the, where's the magic oil there? Or a little holy water? Or you know, at least a, a tissue that you know, you've blowed your nose on or something that take back and there has to be something. There has to be a point of contact there. And we look, as humans, we look for something. But Peter and John had nothing in their hands. They didn't sprinkle water. They didn't say magic words. They just said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Because they knew that the solution was found in a person, not in a ritual, not in a sacrifice, not in a place, not in a religious leader. As a matter of fact, when we look at this story, you get to chapter 4 and you find out that the religious leaders were none too happy about what had happened. Now, they weren't upset about the healing. That was great. But what were they upset about? Because you see, after this man was healed, even in chapter 3... Everybody comes running. Everybody gets there. And Peter, he wasn't Congolese. Because if he had been Congolese, when everybody came running, he would be saying, oh, you see, this man was healed. God has placed the healing power in our hands, and we have the power. If you need a miracle, come, and we will lay our hands, and you will be healed also. In the book of Acts, we see many, many healings, but we never see a call to healing. We never see a message about healing. The messages are all Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so when all the people start running in, you see, the miracle was just an excuse to get everybody together. But the real reason that that man was healed was because there was 5,000 people there that needed to hear the gospel. And so as, there was probably more than that, but there's that many that responded. So as these people all come in, look at Peter and John. Now, again, remember their age. You're these fellers' ages. Come here, I need a Peter and a John. You look like Peter. All right, come here. Oh, he's John? Okay, come here, John. All right. There's Peter and John. Yeah, not bad looking, Peter and John, eh? Pretty good, all right. And they come in, and this feller, he's dancing and shouting, going, oh, man, thank you, boys, thank you, thank you, thank you, oh, that's awesome, oh. And everybody comes running around. And Peter's sitting here going, what'd we do? Yeah. <laughs> huh? Y'all are getting excited like we did some big thing. We didn't do nothing. Well, I don't know, in Des Moines, how would you say that? <laughs> well, we didn't do nothing. That's more Southern Missouri. Okay. Yeah. Why are you looking at us for? Huh? Not us. But we can tell you who did. Thank you, fellas. You sit down. We can tell you who did. And he turns loose and he preaches a salvation message. Well, the Sanhedrin get word of this and they were upset, not because that fella got healed, but they were upset because Peter and John was talking about Jesus. And they're sitting here going, a few weeks ago, we just crucified this dude. And we keep hearing about him. We thought we'd got rid of him. 
And so they call in Peter and John, and there's two young fellers here. I want you to keep that in mind because they're in a very patriarchal society. You respect your elders, eh? No talking back. You say, yes, ma'am, and you say, yes, sir. Is that clear? All right. Yeah, yeah, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and so they're before these older folks here in the Sanhedrin, these older grandpas. And these older grandpas say, boys, what you been up to? Well, nothing. We didn't do anything. Well, this fellow that's healed, did you heal him? No. Well, now something happened. It weren't us. <laughs> they need a hillbilly life Bible. They really do. I could help translate it. It'd be a lot of fun. And, and so finally, these old one old grandpa says, well, then what exactly happened here? Because this boy, we know he weren't walking like that before. And Peter says, well, it's Jesus. You know, the Jesus that y'all crucified a few weeks back, this was not a seeker sensitive message. Uh, he says, you know, with all due respect, Grandpa, you know, it's, it's Jesus. And we've seen this Jesus. We saw him resurrected. We've had an encounter with the risen Lord. And Jesus is the one who healed this man. So you got a problem, you better go talk to him. It weren't our fault we didn't do nothing. And the, the Sanhedrin, it's interesting because they didn't, they didn't even per, forbid the name of Jesus. They said, don't teach in that name anymore. They didn't even want to say that name. Don't go teaching in that name. You can heal people. You can talk about God. You can pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. No problem there. We're good with it. But don't talk about this Jesus. But Peter and John, look at their response in the book of Acts chapter 4. I hope you memorize these verses. If you haven't, that's your other project for this week. Verse 10 to 12. Peter standing before a group of elders as a young man. And he's saying, be it known to you all. And to the people, all the people of Israel. That by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Whom you crucified. <laughs> whom God raised from the dead. And he's showing y'all are on the other side of God. Hmm? Even by him does this man stand here before you whole. This, this is talking about Jesus. This is the stone which was set at not of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation. That word salvation in both Greek and Hebrew is a very comprehensive word. It means deliverance from evil. It can refer to physical healing. It can refer to... Uh, spiritual healing, spiritual deliverance, which is the primary use, of course, in the Bible. But it's a very comprehensive word. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby, y'all know it, we must be saved. There is no other name. There is no other solution. And that is why that I believe that whether... I'm on the mission field, whether I'm in the U.S., whether you're at work, whether you're at school, whether you're in church. Our first and most important job is to proclaim the name of Jesus, is to proclaim that there is salvation in no other. There is no other name. It is only in him. First Timothy 2.5 Paul speaking to Timothy is interesting. I love teaching. Um, well, I love teaching the Old Testament particularly. But I love teaching New Testament survey and looking at the timelines. It really makes some of these books come alive. First Timothy was written probably after Paul's first release from uh, imprisonment in Rome. The imprisonment that's recorded in the book of Acts. He had planted the church of Ephesus just a matter of a few years before. As a matter of fact, he left Ephesus to go to Jerusalem where he would be arrested. So we're talking four to five years after he planted this church. He's now coming out of prison in Rome and he discovers that the church of Ephesus is in a mess doctrinally. They've allowed a lot of other things in. And he sends Timothy to say, go straighten things out down there. And take a look. 1 Timothy 2, 5. 
Paul straightened them out and said, this is the doctrine that you need to teach. And just very simply, he says, there is one God. And there is one mediator between God and man. There's not Jesus plus. There's not Jesus plus the saints. There's not Jesus plus the mother of God. There's not Jesus plus the pasture. There's not Jesus plus the prophets. There is one mediator between God and man. And who is that person? The man, Jesus, Christ Jesus. There is no other name. And I have watched with joy. <laughs> I have watched the power of the Holy Spirit to transform a young lady that uh, was brought to me. Um, and I was asked to talk to this young lady. She had been through some horrific things in her past. And she says, I'm just, I'm looking for deliverance. It seems like the devil is always just, I can't get rid of him. I can't break the bondages. And I, first question I ask her is, have you ever accepted Jesus Christ into your life as your Lord and Savior? And she says, I just did that last week. As I talked to her, I found out that she was still seeing the demonic manifestations and all of that, but the demons could no longer touch her. They were still appearing in her room. They were still threatening her, but they could no longer touch her like they could previously. Because once you belong to Jesus, guess what? <laughs> the devil doesn't have any more rights there. But she was still scared by these things. What's going on? I need more deliverance. She said, I've been to every pastor and prophet and bishop and whatever else. Kisangani, they like titles, boy. Now we even have two different generals of the armies of God. That's an, instead of pastor because pastor is too low of a name. Yeah. She says, I've been to all them and they've told me to pray and to fast and to do this and to go through this ritual and so on and so forth. And yet I'm still dealing with this oppression. I said, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are free. Now you need to let God transform your mind. And that happens through the word. I said, open, what we're going to do is this. I've never done this, but just a Holy Spirit moment. You know, usually you put new converts with the book of John. I said, no, we're going to start with the book of Romans. And I said, uh, we're going to read Romans. I said, I want you to read one chapter a day, but read it several times. She's in university, very educated young woman, so reading was not a problem. So I want you to read each chapter several times. Take notes on it. What is God speaking to you? If there's questions, write down the questions. Come back next week. We're going to sit and talk. And I watched as this young lady who was struggling in school because of the oppression was so incredible, struggling in her family, struggling in every part of life because she was just constantly bound. And as she get, after she gave her heart to Jesus and she began to get into the word, after one week, I'm not exaggerating, she walks into my office and her face was changed. Her face was radiant. And she comes up with her Bible and she digs her notebook out of her bag and she's like, did you see this? And she opens the Bible to Romans chapter 5, verse 1. <laughs> there is out for now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. It says there no condemnation. That means I'm free. Hallelujah. Chapter 6. Sin no longer has dominion over you if you are in Christ Jesus. And as that realization through the word started to hit, this girl changed. After about two months, I even stopped the weekly meetings with her. I'd still touch base with her on the phone, touch base with her occasionally, but she was standing on her own two feet. She was ready to go because her grades improved. Her situation in the family changed because you see, you deal with the root and the leaves become more healthy. You deal with the malaria and the fever will disappear. <laughs> there is no other name. And we're going to wrap up today, church. I told you this is the message. This is the message for Iowa, for Missouri, for Congo, for anywhere else in the world. We have a sick world, but there is a healer. And we can either complain about it or we can say, I want to be part of the solution. Bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning. And if you're here this morning, I don't want to let this pass without asking, first of all, if you're here and you personally have never had a saving encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, you're sick because of sin. Things are falling apart in your life. 
maybe you've got a pocket full of money, you've made lots of money and you've discovered that's not the solution. Maybe you're dead broke, it doesn't matter, but you know your heart's empty. And if you're here this morning and you say, I need Jesus, I wanna give my heart to Jesus. Raise your hand really high and we're gonna pray with you. And there's some people in this church who'd be very happy to pray with you because coming to church won't change anything. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Can I get Brother Weaver? I don't know if you have your deacons or your pastoral staff, but I have them on hand here. Is there anyone else? I'm going to ask the couple men that just raised their hand. If y'all would go over here on the my left, your right. There's a couple of pastoral staff that are going to pray with you and bring you to the feet of Jesus. Come on up, brother. Come on up. See the one over here on my right. Come on up over here. Or can one of you come over here? And there was another, there's another gentleman over here on my left. I want you to pray with them. Pray through with them. Right there. there is no other name. But if you call out to that name of Jesus, he's going to set you free today. He's going to change your life today and you're going to walk out of here different. Yes, there's growing to do. But you're going to change from right now. You're going to change from right now. There's one other person on this side. If you'd stand up real quick. Stand and wait right there. Be there. If there's anybody else, come on up. Now let me talk to you, church. You've had an encounter with Jesus. You've walked with him. Maybe you gave your heart to him like I did as a child. But you spend all your time griping about the world's problems or griping about your own problems or your family's problems or the nation's problems or all the problems and the chaos in the world. And you haven't told anybody about Jesus in a long time. Our job as a church is to bring solution to a hurting world. And guys, that solution goes a lot further. And offering the convoy of hope is good. I make it once in a while. It's a good thing. Keep doing it, all right? I don't know if you give there, but wherever. Huh? But the solution is found in Jesus Christ. And if this morning you're here, and you say, man, I've kind of forgotten that. I've given, I give my money, I help out in the church, I work in the ministries of the church, but it's been a long time since I told somebody about Jesus Christ that can save and deliver, that set me free from sin. But if God gives me the opportunity, and if God will open the doors this week, that's going to change. I want to be used to tell somebody about Jesus. I want to be used... to bring the solution to a world that is broken and a world that's hurting in sin. It's not just your pastors, plural. It's not just their job, your pastoral staff's job. It's not just your department leaders. It's about you. If you have truly had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, whether you're the age of our Peter and John here, or whether you already have grandchildren their age, it doesn't matter. If that's the cry of your heart and you say, I want to be used to tell somebody about Jesus this week, stand on your feet and begin to cry out to God and say, Lord Jesus, fill me with power, fill me with boldness, open the door, give me the opportunity, give me the opportunity. Lord Jesus, I want to be part of the solution. I want to bring healing, not through me, I can't do it, I have nothing to offer, but I know the one who has everything in his hands. Cry out to him and say, Lord Jesus, fill me with boldness, fill me with power, open the door, give me the divine opportunities. This story we read in Acts 3 was a divine opportunity. They didn't go to the temple intending to preach, but it just happened. Ask God, Holy Spirit, we cry out to you this morning, and Father, I ask you for a fresh move of your Holy Spirit on New Hope Urbandale. Father, I pray that the power of your Holy Spirit 
would fall again in this place. God, I pray that those who may have even had an experience in this place with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and yet they've kept their mouth shut. Maybe they pray in tongues, but they no longer testify about you. God, I pray that you would give them a true infilling, that you would fill their heart with fire, that I've got to tell somebody about Jesus. I don't care what the consequences are. I don't care what the responses are, but I got to tell somebody about Jesus and what he's done in my life and what he can do in their life. God, I pray that you would blow over this church, that your power would fall, that your glory would fall. God, I pray that you would open doors of opportunity, God, that whenever we hear a certain conversation or a certain question that's asked, God, the question that we're hearing all over our nation and around the world these days is what is the solution? God, when that, com that question comes up in political conversations maybe, God, I pray that you would give us the boldness to say, I know what the solution is and change that from a political conversation to start talking about Jesus. God, give us those opportunities. Give us the boldness, Father. Give us the fire from our young people that are in school, those who may be in university, those who are in work workplaces, those who are in elementary school, God, I pray that your power, that your fire would descend on them and that you would use us as your people to bring those who are lost and those who are broken and those who are hurting to you. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you, Lord Jesus.